Well, I was. T- my starting point was: What is it like to be? Let me just check on my time. To be old. I'll in prod the, you. Don't in, worry. Right. To be old <laughs> in the city, and of course, it's not a question anyone can answer, <laughs> because there is no such thing as an old person. There's only an old person in a particular context. Um, We know from all the research that people get more different as they age and not more similar. And this really challenges the idea we have of some sort of generic older person that you turn into on some milestone birthday. You know, you hit 50 or 60 or 70 and suddenly all the things that make you you disappear and you become an old person. And of course it's nonsense because if you are, I'm sure if you go to any um, concert hall, museum, uh, theatre in any major city including Bristol, you will see a lot of older people, affluent older people. So the way that age and social class interact is absolutely key. So when I say there's no such thing as an old person, I'm not doing that baby boomer denial thing about, oh, no, we never age, you know, we've vanquished age, which I can't abide. Um, What I'm saying is how we age depends on where we are and what we bring to the aging process. And the city can disable us and the city can enable us because aging is not about the ageing, failing body, as Guy was saying. It's about the interaction between a person or a community and the city. And, you know, cities can be pretty inhospitable places. Um, You know, outside the university where I teach, I try this every time I go into the university. I try and cross the road before that green man starts to flash. And I walk, in spite of having messed up my knee ten years ago, I'm a pretty fast walker, and I can never get across before that green man starts to flash. And that is just one example. My local authority uh, are cutting at least half the public toilets in the borough, and at the same time they're introducing what they call a wee fine for people who wee in the street. I mean, what better way to keep people with disabilities and old people and pregnant people at home. So I think we need to think about ways in which the city, and isn't it interesting, we're talking about age-friendly cities, and I've immediately started talking about age-unfriendly cities. So uh, uh, my colleagues are going to talk a lot more, I think, about the actual practical things that can be done um, about uh, cities and how to make them more um, age-friendly. I feel very strongly about this idea that the city's centres are increasingly becoming age-cleansed, age-apartheid, age-ghettos. There are certain parts of the city that seem to be the preserve of young, able-bodied, affluent people. And I think that is a terrible loss. It is a loss for old people who don't have the stimulation of young people. It's a loss for young people who don't have the stimulation of old people and aren't given another model of how to age. And I actually, um, I'm going to um, end by um, talking uh, in this um, bit of my um, thing about the way we need, uh, just uh, picking up on what Guy said, of really challenging those dominant discourses, the one that says you are either going to fail, uh, your body is going to fail as you age, or you're going to deny age, that there's nothing in between. And I say there is something in between. There is another model which resists ageism but doesn't resist age, embraces (coughs) age. And I think that, I mean, there was a wonderful woman in the 1970s and 80s, Kathy Itzin, who started age awareness training. And I think we all need a bit of age awareness training because what we need are cities that allow our bodies and our minds to change, to have changing capacities, changing interests, changing lives, and don't punish us for it and don't see that as decline. So I think I'll stop there. I think I've just done five minutes.